Hey guys, my name is Caitlin. And I'm Jeremy. And we want to say welcome to Coast Hills and Happy Together Weekend. There's lots of excitement around here as we get ready for Christmas. Christmas celebrations start at Coast Hills at 4 p.m. We are having the best Christmas party ever called All is Bright. It's everything you love about Christmas in one afternoon. It's really fun and we hope you'll invite all your friends to come with you. We are also looking forward to celebrating Christmas Eve with you. This year we are going to have five Christmas Eve services. We have special invitations available that you can personalize and hand out to people. And we also need your help with these services. So please fill out the volunteer sign up form you received on your way in and drop it off at the Connect Space in the lobby and someone will follow up with you. Also, Christmas Day, December 25th, falls on a Sunday this year. And everyone will be home for Christmas because we won't be having Sunday services at Coast Hills. Instead, you can join us on Facebook Live for a quick devotion with Pastor Chet. More details on that to come. That's all we have for you today. We hope you have a great Sunday and a great week. Coast Hills, what's going on, everybody? Oh yeah? Oh, I got, my name got called and then I heard a woo! That was pretty awesome. Um, let's all stand together this morning. Joy to the world together. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive our King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Come on. These hands lifted high. Hear my song. Hear my song. 
hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice. I will bring a sacrifice. joy. Let's put our hands together. I hear like two or three of you doing it. <laughs> Here we go together. It would be my joy to say, sing it, your way, yeah, your way. up louder. Come on. It would be my joy to say your will, if your way, it would be my joy to say your will, your way, it would be my joy to say your will, your way, always. Judah, he 
is roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him and our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before him Whoa. Open up to so open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Sing it out. It's our God is the lion, the lion of Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. And our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. The Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess the name of Jesus on that day. So who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord? Yeah. And who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord singing over the battle? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? And no one. But who can stop the Lord? Yeah. All right, guys, here we go. Sing it out. And our God is the liar. The Lion of Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Amen. Would you guys bow your heads with me? Mighty God, thank you so much for who you are. We rejoice in who you are, God. You are the lion. You are strong like a lion. You provide us strength. You lead us forward in strength. We recognize that you are almighty. There is nothing bigger. There is nothing stronger. There's nothing more uh, huge than who you are, God. And so we, we recognize that fact. We also know that you are the lamb, the lamb that was slain to break the chains of our captivity and set us free from sin, that we may walk in freedom, that we may live in freedom, God. May we remember that every day. God, thank you for this church a place where we can freely confess your name, that we can freely sing songs that sing your name, God. We pray for the church around the world, God, that are celebrating you in, in so many different places, in caves underground, in big churches above ground, wherever it is, God, thank you for your people around the world. God, we give you this service. All glory, honor, and power is yours. And the whole church said, amen. amen. Well, what's up, guys? My name is Jordan, and I lead students here at uh, Coast Hills. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you. 
What a great song, you know, and singing about the lion and the lamb. I love the many attributes of God. If you go through the Psalms, you can find over a hundred different titles for the name of God, descriptions of God. God is so amazing, but what is amazing, you guys, is the fact that the key characteristic of God is love, is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, John 3, 16. It says in Song of Songs 2, 4 that the banner over us is love. And it's because of that love, the love that he gave to us, that we respond together as a community in love. Because that's what we believe here at church. We as a church, we believe in community. And what's neat about community is it's, it's so defined by, by talking with each other and being with each other, but it's also defined by prayer. We as a church, we believe in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray continually, always. I was praising the Lord this morning for a man that li- that's in this church that I know he's praying for me all the time. And what strength comes from that because of that. So there is strength as we join together in prayer. And so what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to gather with people around you and jump into a time of prayer. But here, here's what I want you to pray for specifically. Today is going to be an incredible day. God is going to move. We've been praying about it. We're expecting him here. The spirit is here. And so pray for your time of response today. Pray that God would stir something fresh and new within you. Whether you're, this is your first time at church, or you've been going to church for over 50 years, pray that something new and fresh comes today. So jump with a few people around you guys and go ahead and pray about that.
joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Sing choirs of angels. Sing exaltation oh sing all ye citizens of heaven above glory to God oh, glory in the highest who oh, come let Adore him, oh come let us adore him, oh come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Amen. Born this happy morning, Jesus, to Thee be all glory give. Word of our Father, now in flesh appearing, oh come. Good morning, everyone. Glad you guys are here. Well, um, let's remain standing and in your Bible can turn to Revelation chapter 1, please. Revelation chapter 1. We just stand to honor God and just honor God's word. So here at Coast Hills, Revelation chapter 1. So we're going to be in verse 9. And my name is Jonah. Um, as of Friday, I am just a recent uh, Patmos graduate. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so Patmos, you might have seen us running around here at um, church. We've been serving. Um, possibly you had us over for dinner <laughs> in the past four weeks and we ate all of your food. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, just for your guys' hospitality for um, having us here. It's been awesome. And yeah, just looking forward to the new year. Um, we're starting an internship program in January. And so um, me and a couple other guys will be coming back um, for that. So just grateful to be here with you guys to be together. So 
But yeah, if you guys want to follow along, we'll be in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. And the word of God says this. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word, God. Lord, I thank you for being here in this room with us, Lord. Lord, we know by this description in your word, God, that you are mighty and that you are powerful, Lord. And what an honor and what a privilege it is to serve you, God. So grateful that you are for us, Lord, and that we are on your team, God. I pray today, Lord, just as we hear testimonies of your goodness and your faithfulness, God, that you would just give us listening ears, Lord, that you would give us attentive hearts to your word. Transform us today by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, Coast Hills. You can have your seat. It's great to see you all this morning. Um, a little bit different this morning, as you can see. Would you please welcome to the stage my incredible, lovely wife, Andrea. As well, joining us by miracle, Jen and Adam. <laughs> So, Jen, um, how do you feel being up here? <laughs> I'm psyched. I'm really psyched. Yeah. Uh, how, long, how long have you been looking forward to this, Jen? <laughs> a couple weeks, although I did pray this morning that my car wouldn't start. <laughs> then I <I'd be> like... <laughs> now, why would you pray that your car wouldn't start, Jen? Huh? I don't like being on stage. <laughs> but also I am getting used to this well, microphone. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm getting used to this microphone. <laughs> I'm, enjoying, just... I'm enjoying it. Would you like to just take over now? Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. As well, Zach and Audrey are with us. And, uh, and Justin and Summer uh, also are with us. Very, very thankful. We have been talking about the generous gift of Jesus. And in the generous gift last week, um, we learned and we received the birth announcement of the King of Kings. The birth announcement of the Lord of Lords, his name, Yeshua, Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. Paul would say in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that this coming was a great mystery. That's what he would say, a great mystery. Because in the Old Testament, it wasn't as if it was just simply called out, here's when it will happen, here's what will happen. No, there were pieces that needed to be put together because that's our faith. Paul would say that he was vindicated by the Spirit. He was uh, as well seen by angels. He was proclaimed to the nations, believed on in the world. He was taken up in glory. In fact, the very presence that you're here, that you believe in Jesus, is the evidence that he was alive and that he died and that he rose again. You see, though this was a mystery to the Jews, confidently, Isaiah the prophet, 740 years prior to the birth of Christ, would announce that Jesus, that God, would be with us. Now we get to sing, away in a no. 
We tried this last week. You would think that you were prepared and ready to join me. You see, because Isaiah announced we are able to confidently sing that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He was born of the Virgin Mary. The angels, they would proclaim to the shepherds like we learned last week. And then the shepherds would go and they would worship in the stable. For 33 years, Jesus would live his life exactly the way that Isaiah prophesied. He'd be wonderful. He'd be a counselor. He would be the mighty God and is the mighty God, the father of eternity and the prince of peace. If anyone would know and see that, it would be the Apostle John. In fact, when he wrote his letter, he said this. He made it very clear, I've seen him, I've heard him, and I've touched him that I'm proclaiming to you. See, John would listen to the Sermon on the Mount, but he would also watch him bring to life the daughter of Jairus. He would listen to him minister to a woman who the Pharisees wanted to be executed. And he would also watch him feed the 5,000. If anyone knew Jesus, it was John. That's why he could say, what I heard, what I saw, what what, what I touched, I'm letting you know, I'm proclaiming to you even after the resurrection. When Jesus had resurrected from the dead and they were in the boat, it was John that would jump out of the boat and say, it's Jesus. And he would run towards the shore. John knew who Jesus was. And now in Revelation chapter 1, it's 60 years later. 60 years after this incredible uh, 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 resurrection. And John is on the island that's called Patmos. Patmos. You see, he was a prisoner. A prisoner of Rome because he wouldn't stop proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the king. Now, in the Roman world, that's a problem. Because in the Roman world, Caesar was the only king. In the Roman world, Caesar was worshipped. And for there to be any other king, well, that would create a problem. And so John, well, church history tells us they, they made him drink poison, but he wouldn't die. They would say, church history, that he was bo- uh, boiled in oil. and He just wouldn't die. And so Domitian, to get rid of this problem, he would banish him to the island of Patmos. This was a traditional punishment. In fact, Tacitus, the Roman historian, he would explain to us that the Romans would always banish these prisoners on these Greek islands. This island, Patmos, well, it means my killing. Take a look at what Patmos looks like. It's treeless. It's brown. And it would be there that John would find why this island was called my killing. You see, this particular island, this was not a place for a man that's over 90 years old. It was there that the prisoners, they would have to go into the quarries and they would have to mill the stone in order to ship out for the Romans to build their grand coliseums. But it was there that this apostle would say, it's my tribulation." If you're taking note, it was there. It's number one that John would turn and listen to the voice of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. You see, Jesus is not just the generous gift that was given to us in the Bible. Jesus is the generous gift that keeps on giving. Because it would be one day while John was under all of this tribulation and all of this turmoil that Jesus, he would show up. No longer was he physically present with John, but he would present himself spiritually and John would hear a voice just like Jonah would read. A voice much like we can hear today because Jesus is the generous gift and he's still speaking to us today. And as Jonah read, listen, John would hear this voice, this voice that he knew, this voice that he remembered This voice that he walked with, that he touched, this voice that he constantly heard for the three years of his discipleship. If anyone knew the voice of John, the voice of Jesus, it would be John. The Bible says that he turned when he heard this voice. In fact, he would turn and describe for us a spiritual portrait of Jesus. Now, many of us, we think Jesus looked like this. Now, I don't know if you know, but that's the Mormon Jesus. 
And many of us, we think that Jesus had blue eyes and long flowing brown hair and and maybe Jesus was laughing or maybe Jesus was crying. I'll never forget, I was in Korea and they were showing me a picture of Jesus and I said, well, where is he? And they pointed to this Asian man. I said, that's not Jesus. You see, I think we oftentimes develop a portrait of what Jesus looked like, but what John is going to describe for us is a spiritual portrait of who Jesus is for us today. It's a spiritual portrait because he's the gift that keeps on giving. The first thing that he paints for us is this precious voice, this voice that was like a trumpet. Now, I don't know if you've been in troubled times like John and you needed to hear the voice of God, but this voice like a trumpet, this is an announcement. That's what the Israelites would use a trumpet for. They would shout it out. They would blow it out for everyone to hear because an announcement was coming. And now this particular announcement, Jesus has an announcement. He's got a message for the church. And in the midst of John's greatest trial, Jesus would loudly speak to him, And John would choose to listen to his voice instead of the noise around him. I love that in the midst of our trial, we can hear the voice of the Lord like John. And sometimes that trial is an emotional thing we're going through and it's in our mind. And many times it's physical. And for me, one of my biggest trials was when we were in the Civil War in Liberia, back in West Africa, And I was all of 23 years old, and we had been there. I was there with my firstborn child, who was just about a year. I was weaning Micaiah. And we had just adopted a little two-year-old Liberian boy. Chet had gone to do business in Ghana, a neighboring country, and buy a dugout canoe for our church. And while he was gone, he left us with a family in Monrovia, a Liberian family, because it was a little tense in the country at the time, and you never knew what would happen with the political situation. It was Easter time, and we were getting ready for his flight to come in the next day. He had been gone a little over a week. We were so excited to see him again. And that night, in the middle of the night, around 2 a.m., we woke up to bombs going off outside the house and planes flying overhead and chaos and ran into the hallway with my Liberian family and the fear that was in their eyes. And we heard next day that they had bombed the airport. So we thought, okay, Chet's not coming back today. And What turned out to be a week long there, um, our food went down to a little half cup of rice a day that we were eating because it was someone to risk their life to go even into the market and and find food. You'd risk getting shot. So I had this little baby that I was weaning. And so as a mom, I'm, you know, worried about having milk for him. And the Lord provided this little woman in a village behind us. She sent a bottle of Ensure milk every day. And out of the nothing that she had, she gave me all she had. And Micaiah had milk that week. What went on to be a week of just stories of my Liberian friends telling me what had happened in these coups before when these soldiers would come into town. It was fearful. There was rape and there was pillage and there was massacre and death and horrible atrocities that they would commit. And so I I was afraid. And I think I felt so bad for being afraid. I mean, I was a missionary. Why should I be afraid? But I love that I happened to be reading through the Psalms at that time, really for the first time in depth. And I came across this psalm where David said, when I am afraid, I will trust the Lord. And the Lord reminded me, it's okay that you're afraid, trust me. And what I realized was if David was a man after God's own heart, he was a king. He was afraid, it's okay. It made me feel a little better that I was afraid. And so during that week, I I had sat toward the end of the week up on the hill and I was just watching the city burn in the distance and these boys were driving up in their porcupine trucks, is what we called them, and they had these Rastafarian wigs and soulless eyes and just so scary and their threats, AK-47 sticking out every which way. And I sat there in prayer on the mountain and I was just so afraid. And I remember looking at the sun that was setting over the burning city in the distance and the Lord reminded me of his word in Psalms where he says, the heavens declare the glory of God and that he sets the sun like a, in a tent and it makes, it makes its circuit coming up to the place where it sets. And God reminded me of his sovereignty and that he was in control and that no matter what those boys threatened to rape me or to murder me, God had all and not anything was going to happen lest he would allow it. Mm. And so in the midst of that trial, as I heard his voice speak to me from his word, My response was peace, and I had his peace. Amen. See, Jesus resurrected, and we read how wonderful he was. But the truth of the matter, as he spoke to John, he's still speaking today. 
And he spoke words of comfort and security to Andrea in the midst of her greatest storm in the same way that he spoke to John. These words of faith and hope and love. Secondly, if you look, it's Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. If you're taking note, it's number two. You can write it down. Jesus is in the midst of us. Did you read that verse? I want to highlight that word for you again. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, verse 13, and in the midst. And maybe you want to underline that word midst just for a moment and understand what he is saying. You see, it's just a little bit later in Revelation chapter 1 that he discusses what these lampstands are. These lampstands are the church. It's you. It's me. We're the church of the living God. Those that believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died and rose again. You see, he offers salvation to us. And for us who are called the church, we believe not that Jesus is watching us from a distance. Not that he has died and he, he's not living. No, we believe in a living God. And that Jesus is ever so close to us. In fact, so close, he's in the midst of us. He communicates in the ear and he says, listen, I see one as a son of man. And what he's saying, so you can understand, he's saying, I saw the son of man. This was a title that was given to Jesus. All the way back in Daniel chapter 7, it's the title of the Messiah, the son of man. It would display for us in this title that he was all man and he was all God as the Messiah. He is the Son of Man. And Luke would point this out several times through his gospel. But what I love about Jesus, because he is the Son of Man, he can sympathize with our weakness. He's in the midst of us. He understands what we're going through. He's the gift that keeps giving. In fact, there's a beautiful picture of this word midst. It's in John chapter 19. And in John chapter 19, Jesus is in the midst of of the two thieves, and he died on a cross. And one of those thieves would look at him and say, would you remember me today? And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus went to the cross on that particular day to be right in the midst of those thieves, to tell that thief, I'm with you. I'm not gonna forsake you. In fact, so much so, you will be with me today. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, you can see this to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? The words of him who holds the seven stars in the right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. He's in our midst so much so that he has a ministry to us, even now and today. He describes this ministry in Revelation chapter 7. I'll read it for you, verse 17. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's what a shepherd does. He takes care of us in the midst of us. This idea of Jesus being in the midst is uh, one that has completely transformed not only my life, but my wife's life as well. You know, we uh, both came to the Lord at this church as young kids, and uh, Jen was in first grade when she was invited by a friend and came to discover that Jesus was in the midst of uh, not only this church, but her life. And for me, in the same way, when I was, uh, when I was in sixth grade, right before sixth grade year, my, my parents decided that it would be a good idea to move right before I started junior high. So um, that was really fun for me. Um, so I, not only was it uh, the tumultuous years of junior high, can I get an amen from the students in the back? That's right. I see your hand. All right. <laughs> but uh, I was also the new kid. And um, we had gone to church before that, and I, I understood a, a little bit of what the Bible said. I knew there were verses, and we sang songs, and uh, there, was, there was donuts. But really, church for me as a young kid was really just another place I got in trouble. And um, through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I really went on this journey of trying to figure out who am I? Where do I belong? Where do I fit? All the friends and community that I had back in my old house was now gone. And I brought to a place where I'm wondering, like, like most of us, going, who am I? My family had been on a, going to different churches, uh, kind of church shopping, if, if we can use that term. And we, we ended up here at Coast Hills. And it was here at Coast Hills that I discovered Jesus in the midst of the church. 
in the midst of the church through, uh, through the people's faces, through the way that they interacted with each other, through their smiles. And uh, the question of who I am no longer mattered because the, the, the answer was Jesus was in my midst and Jesus was calling me to belong. Jesus was calling me to an adventure and to a, a, a life that mattered for him. So in 1999, in room 101, I gave my life to Christ because I knew that Jesus was in my midst, that Jesus is in our midst. And from that point, it wasn't just a one-time thing, but time and time and time again, Jesus has been in, in the midst of all of our lives, in my life specifically, as he's called me to ministry and called me to a place to work here and, and given me a calling beyond just a job. And and time and time again, even this, uh, this last season, in the last three and a half years, having uh, two of our own kids, two boys specifically, and being reminded in this Christmas season of the story of God giving his son Jesus as a baby. I remember Ryder was born in October, um, so we were new parents and Christmas had come upon us. And the first time we dropped Ryder off was Christmas Eve service. So uh, my wife went in, dropped Ryder off, gave all the details. I followed up, gave all the details. The volunteer was like, your wife was just in here. Go to church. I was like, okay. So we came into church and with new lenses, uh, we recognized that Jesus was in our midst in a new way. I watched this little boy stand up and um, dance to a song amidst the snow falling from the sky. And at that moment, to see this little boy and to think about my kid and think about God giving his son to be in our midst, Jen and I both, like, we lost it. We're weeping in the pew right over here, like, ah, just crying. Just being reminded of the simple truth that Jesus is in our midst. And our response and our uh, return to Christ and our response to God is that we would hope that, that all of us, that, that we've made it our life's passion, that all of us would understand that Jesus is in our midst. Whether through a smile or a handshake or a high five or a hug, that Jesus is here, that he came to be with us and now lives in each one of us. And I get to see that so clearly in the, wife, in the way that my wife cares for our two little boys at home as, as she is literally Jesus in the midst of our house to our little boys. Um, so yes, we have two little boys and I was um, blessed to be able to grow up in a Christian household. Um, but I feel like I really grew in my understanding of the Lord and how much he loves and cares for us and the gift that he is to us um, when we had our boys because there's nothing that they can do or say that's going to make me love them any less. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just a fraction of how the Lord feels about us. Um, there are tough days. Don't, let me, <laughs> don't get me wrong. But um, I think that in this season of my life, it's my response to Jesus isn't necessarily something that I'm doing, but um, just in raising those boys. Um, and if you know Ryder, don't judge me yet. We've got some time to... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's true. He's the generous gift that keeps giving. It allows Jen to be the mom she is, Adam to be the dad that he is, because Jesus is giving to them. And then they are giving to their kids. If you're taking note, it's number three. Take a look, if you would. It's Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. I'm going to pick it up there in the middle. He was clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. If you are taking note, maybe you can write down, Jesus is our wise high priest. You see, when John turned around and he saw this visual of Jesus, he saw him wearing the high priest garments. Now, the golden sash that was around him, usually the high priest would wear around their waist and they would tuck their, 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 their clothes into this uh, sash so that they can do the work in the temple. But Jesus' sash, it wasn't around his waist because the work was done. Jesus' sash, it was worn around his chest, almost as if an award. I've completed the work. I died on the cross, and now I can offer eternal life because I've had victory over death. When he turned and he saw the Lord, not just this high priest, but a wise high priest. You see, he saw him white as snow. 
He, he saw him with this woolen hair. And I wonder if just for a moment John remembered when Jesus was transfigured before him. And the light that Jesus is shone out of him. And John was able to just for a moment see the glory of God. And now looking at this visual, I wonder, did he recognize that glory? You see, when Moses was coming down off the mountain, he was there for 40 days. And the reflection of the glory of God was on Moses, much like the moon shines the reflection of the sun. And as Moses came down, he had to veil his face and cover his face because the children of Israel didn't want to look at the glory of God. But now, Jesus looking at John, there he is. He is the glory of God. And he's known, Daniel chapter 7, because of this glory as the ancient of days the wise high priest. He's been through every situation. He's known every experience. He's able to give every bit of advice because he is the wise high priest. Yeah, for Audrey and I, we've been on an adventure of faith. And I think uh, throughout our lives, a lot of ups, a lot of downs, and... Um, mm -hmm. you know, something on the road to getting to this place. And well, we, we have three kids, three and under, so we're still on our adventure of faith um, every day. But the process of, of getting here has been, okay, Jesus, what, is this, what does this wisdom look like? And in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul, uh, he gives us a little clarity into the wisdom, and he says in verse 18, If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And as the Lord began to really work in our hearts, and I think individually, before we were even married, uh, we began to walk this path of, of what does it really mean to follow Jesus? And, and what does it look like to say, okay, the world says this is what a good decision is. The world says this is what wisdom is. And does that match up with what Jesus is asking of me? And I, I'm reminded of the rich young ruler. And Jesus goes to the rich young ruler and he says, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and follow me. And, and I think I would look at that with worldly eyes and I would say, that makes no sense. And, and yet that began this process. And, you know, Andrea, even as, even as you were describing this woman who had nothing and would bring you a bottle of sugar milk and it's like that, when she looks at her family and what's in front of her, that's not a good decision. And yet, and yet that prompting of the Spirit and knowing what it looks like to really follow the Lord, it's the widow's might. It's I'm, I'm going to be willing to lay everything down and to follow you. And I'm going to make decisions with my finances and with my family. And, and I think that's learning what it means to follow Jesus and having a willingness to let go of everything and to lay it at his feet and say, okay, Lord, whatever you want, we're talking about the response, the response that we have in the generous gift of Jesus. It's like, if I looked, if I was God and I looked at, I have a son and how am I going to make good decisions? I would have done nothing that he did. And when, even when I look at the way that I respond to Jesus sometimes in my flesh, it's like I wouldn't give myself a second chance. That's not a good decision. But the Lord in his grace and mercy, it's like over and over again because his wisdom is not of this world and it offers something that the world doesn't understand. And as I follow him, am I willing to look like a fool in pursuit of him and in saying, okay, not my will, but your will be done, and I want to follow you. I was blessed to grow up in a Christian household, and yet I still found myself after high school and in college still so enticed with the world's desires and what they had to offer and uh, the world's standard of success. And before Zach and I had even met, I was on this perfect p pathway to serving our country and working in the foreign service. I had studied abroad in the Middle East and in Europe. I, I learned all my languages and had passed the tests and uh, landed up at the American Embassy in Austria, which is where I, I met this one. 
and was at a crossroads because I found myself um, asking the question, is this what I want or is this what God wants? And God asked me to lay that down and, and to sacrifice uh, what I believed was, was going to make me happy and content and to succumb to what, what he wanted for me. And ultimately, he knew my heart so much more than I, I knew my heart. And he called me uh, not, just to, not just to overlook all of my previous desires, but to, to acknowledge and enjoy the plan that he had, uh, a plan of family and of, of ministry. And uh, my, my response has been a daily response. Am I dwelling on the past or am I looking to the future and looking what, at what God has, has provided for not just me, but my family and those around me uh, because of that daily response? So when Jesus says something like, when someone forces you to go one mile, go two. When he says love your enemy, in fact, pray for, bless, and do good. It seems like such foolishness, but yet the wisdom of God. He's with us. He's the gift that keeps giving, communicating to us how to live our lives. But I want you to see what else John saw. It's Revelation chapter 1. I'm going to pick it up there in verse 14. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. There was no missing Jesus. There was no up. Now, who was that? There's no mistaking that this is the Son of Man. This is the Son of God. This is Jesus the Christ. I mean, eyes like burning fire. Feet like this burning bronze. You know what he's talking about when you see bronze and it's inside that molten fire. And it's lit up golden because it's so hot. And then his voice? His voice so overwhelming, I'll never forget. My wife and I, we lived in Brazil for about six months. And while we were there, we went to Foz de Aguaçu. It's the world's largest waterfall. While we were there, as we were trying to talk to each other, there was no way even if we screamed for us to be able to hear each other because the roar of the water was so overwhelming. There was no mistaking this incredible voice, this incredible visual that this was Jesus. His presence was overwhelming. We see this portrait of Jesus in Revelation and, and it does um, stop upon this description of the voice of the Lord. And it's an incredibly powerful thing when God speaks, creation happens and um, things change course mm -hmm. and things take new direction and reshape. And there's this incredible portrait of the voice of the Lord in Psalm 29. I'm just going to read some selected pieces of it. Listen to this in verse 3. It says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. It breaks the cedars of Lebanon, which would be our equivalent of like the redwood forest. Huge trees. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. It shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer even give birth. He sits enthroned. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. And may the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. And I love how the psalm ends with that, bless his people with peace, because his voice is loud like the roar of many waters. It's screaming loud. And when he speaks, it's undeniable when he does speak. But yet the purpose behind God speaking is so that he can convey the heart of God the Father to those who would hear. So you stand in awe of how mighty it is, and then you realize and are almost paralyzed in a good way by this is God's heart. And the voice of the Lord is all about restoration. It's all about rebuilding. It's all about renewing. It's all about bringing back peace and hope. And for Summer and I, we've walked through some pretty incredible things this past year together as a couple. Our family's been rocked by some changes that we didn't see coming. And, and I'm going to hand it off to Summer to share some of those things. Um, 
about nine months ago, my dad passed away. Um, my parents split when I was really young, and I didn't, I didn't really have a relationship with my dad growing up. And kind of the older I got, the less and less it it became. And I'd always gone through in my head what it was going to be like when I got the phone call one day that my dad was gone. And I kind of just figured that would be it. I'd get a phone call, and it would end there. But um, it happened a little differently. My brother called and told me that my dad was in the hospital. Um, and immediately inside of inside of me, I was just thought, you know, I don't need I don't need to go. He wouldn't have come for me if I was in the hospital. But just right after that, I felt a strong voice inside of me. It was God's voice telling me to go. Um, and I did. I went down to the hospital. I walked into the hospital room, and I saw my dad laying in his hospital bed. And I was just filled with compassion for him, so much compassion. Um, a week later, we found out that he had stage 4 cancer that had just spread throughout his entire body. Um, and at that moment, I... I committed to be there for him every day. I took off work. Um, Justin actually took off work so he could stay with our, our boys. Um, my brother arranged for my dad to go home and just be there with hospice, and we were all there with my dad as much as we could be. Um, within a few days of him going home, he was no longer speaking. He was just in an unconscious state. And I remember going over and sitting next to him and like holding his hand and telling him that I loved him, and he opened his eyes, and with everything in him, he said it back. He said, I love you too. Mm. And that was, those are the last words that my dad ever spoke. Um, and for me, that was special in that moment. I knew that my dad knew that I loved him, and that was really important, important to me. Um, I went home that night, talking through everything with Justin, which is all so fast, um, just even talking through my childhood, and Justin asked if I had any good memories with my dad, and I couldn't think of any. I didn't have any good memories at all. Um, and then the next morning, my sister called and said she was there. She said it, you know, it was time, it's getting close. So I drove down there, and when I got down there, um, he was already gone. Um, and I called Justin. I'm walking around outside my dad's house, talking to Justin you know, crying, and um, I'm filled with just this overwhelming just rush of emotions, and um, I started remembering good memories when I was a child of my dad and being a little girl, and just happy, happy memories just started flooding back, and um, I knew that God had restored what had been lost, and um, I'm just so thankful that his voice is so much greater than my own mm. and that his voice heals. And so the voice of the Lord absolutely does heal and <laughs> it comes in like a rushing storm, which is what Psalm 29 explains. The voice of the Lord is like a tempest that pushes from sea onto land and creates destroys old strongholds and creates new dependence upon him. And we're going to respond to that now as we sit here, both Summer and I, but with you. And as a musician and as a writer, I, I respond many times through song because I have deep feelings and I need something to get those ideas out through. And so um, what does it look like to wait on the Lord? That's the question I want us to sit with. The psalm says, more than watchmen wait for the morning more than watchmen wait for the morning. What does it look like to wait for the Lord's voice in that way? And so um, let's do this. Let's just stay where we're at. Let's close our eyes, and let's begin to open the conversation with God and say, God, what does it look like to hear from you? And I'll just sing this song that I wrote over us in this moment, and let's keep this dialogue open with God as I sing. And let the Spirit kind of minister to us in this space as a response to what we've been hearing all morning so far.
I can feel it coming over the mountains Like a mighty rushing storm When your clouds come surround without warning I'll wait for you So send your voice over many waters Across the plains, across the valleys below And more than watchmen wait for the morning I'm waiting for you I'll wait for you I'll wait for you And you will find me on top of the mountains And you will find me in rushing storms your clouds surround I'll search you out for your voice And you will find me in many waters You will find me in valleys below Watch I'll wait I'll stand, I'll stay for your for your voice, your voice, oh, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than John in chapter 1, verse 17, I want you to see his response. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John responds with worship. You've heard how each one of them have responded, Jesus. Yes, truly, he was the wonderful God. He was mighty. He was the father of eternity. Everything that Isaiah would announce. But he's the generous gift that keeps giving. And the question then becomes, what is your response? I love Jesus. Jesus, he sees John here at this picture. Jesus, he laid his hand, his right hand on him, and he said, fear not. I'm the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of death and Hades. 
Jesus responds with faith, and it's something that we either choose to believe or not. He responds and he says, I'm alive. That's faith. It's a choice to believe whether or not Jesus Christ died for me, and he offers himself as the generous gift of God. But he didn't just respond with faith. No, he said, I'm alive forevermore. He responds with hope. Jesus is the father of eternity. He's the one that can give eternity. He has hope for you right now, choosing to believe in him by faith. But I love Jesus. In the same way he touched each one of them, in the same way he touched me and my wife, he reaches out and the Bible says he put his hand on John. What a loving moment. It's like touching your wife or even right now hold, reaching over and just grabbing her hand. It's like holding your children or putting your hand on their face. There's something so loving about touch, something so intimate about ch touch. And Jesus responds with this faith, hope, and love reaching out to you. What will be your response? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much that we can come before you and Lord, in the same way you reached and touched John, in the same way that you reached out and grabbed Peter from the water, you are reaching out to us today. You're the generous gift that keeps on giving. And so, Lord, I pray with our response today that we, like John, would recognize you're our Lord and you're our Savior, you're our God, King of kings. Exactly what Isaiah said is exactly what happened because it's exactly who you are. Thank you, Jesus. And if you're a Christian right now, you, you, you're praying. Because this is the opportunity for those of you who don't believe for those of you that don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, he's reaching out to you. Your heart's beating right now because you know what I've said is truth. You know what I'm communicating is something real. You've listened to the power of testimony that Jesus is alive and that Jesus is the resurrected Lord. And he's still speaking today and right now he's speaking to you. What you feel happening, it wasn't what you ate last night. It's Jesus He's alive and he's well and he's offering faith simply to believe in the generous gift of God. And you can have eternal life. That he died on a cross for you and he rose again. Now if you're a Christian, you're in prayer and if you brought a friend, this is where you're bold enough to kind of do this and say, this is why I brought you. Listen carefully. Because Jesus died for you. He paid a price that you couldn't pay so that one day, because he rose from the dead and conquered death, you could be in heaven. But he's speaking to you right now and today. And if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith. I'm going to ask you to simply stand right where you're at. And here's what's going to happen. When you stand, the church is going to erupt in applause. We see it at every service here because we're so excited about the gift of Jesus in our life. And we can't wait to what Jesus is going to do for you. And if you're sitting here and would like to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, know that you are saved and that one day you will be able to be with God. Would you just stand right where you're at and say, Chet, that's me. I want to pray and receive Jesus as my Savior and Lord. You just stand right where you're at. And take that bold step of faith. I get it. I was the guy that sat there. My, I was sweating the whole deal. And then the Lord just spoke to me and I stood. Is there anyone that would say, that's me, I want Jesus. And to the believer. You, you heard Jen and Adam. Amen. We love it at Coast Hills when the Holy Spirit interrupts me. Is there anyone else that would say, I'm going to follow the courage of this woman and I want Jesus. I'm just going to wait just a minute longer.
we want to pray with you. And we're all going to pray because we glorify God together here at Coast Hills. And I'd love to connect with you afterwards. But I'd like to lead you in a prayer. And we're all going to pray for you and with you as you ask Jesus and receive this generous gift of God. Would you pray with me? And I know it's going to be my words, but let it be your heart. And would you pray with me? Church, would you pray along with me? Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God and that you died for me and that you rose again. Thank you for saving me and that today I am a follower of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, we have a Bible and a Bible study that we'd love to give you. So make sure that you see me after church. And uh, we're just so excited for what God is going to do in your life. We're applauding because we know what Jesus has done for us. But you're the believer that's sitting there. And you listen to these testimonies that said, you know what, I was in church, I was doing the church thing, but Jesus had to convince me, and he did, and he's with me. And you've been sitting in your church, you've been coming, but you listen to that testimony, and you're like, you know what, I need to start taking some action with this thing I called faith. And I want to pray for you. And I'm going to ask you simply, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. Chet, would you pray for me? It's time for me to have the testimony that I hear in those that are leading this church. Is there someone who say, yeah, that's me. Um, would you I see you. Just keep your hands up. It's time. It's me. I'm not going to just be sitting here. I am going to choose. I see you, man. That's awesome. Is there anyone else? Say, that's me. Chet, would you just pray for me? I see you guys. Would you just kind of leave your hand up, kind of like as an act of surrender, and would you pray with me, Lord Jesus, I come before you, and I'm so thankful for those in humility that have raised their hand and said, that's me. And I pray, Father, that you would begin to speak words of life to them. You're living, you're well, you're active. And I ask you now, Lord, fill them with faith. Fill them with faith and hope and touch them. Touch them, Lord, like you touched John. And reveal yourself to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the point in our service where we get to say law. Where we get to pause and reflect and take a moment. And we've been... Uh, We've been giving you verses throughout the, the week and at the end of each weekend to reflect on. And, and this verse, this week, our Selah verse is uh, from that passage that we just read. From Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. And it's a portion of it. And it reads in this way. It says, Behold, for I am alive forevermore. And that's Jesus that is speaking. That's Christ that says, I, I died, but I resurrected. I am alive, not just now, but forevermore. And in our Selah moment, we get to pause and respond. And there's going to be a, a variety of opportunities in which you can participate and respond with. You just heard a bunch of different testimonies of response. And now it's our chance as a community, as a congregation, to respond. So I'm going to invite the, the volunteers forward, and we're going to give of our offering. In response to what God has done, we give back to him. Chet and Zach are going to make their way over the waters, and uh, we're going to have baptisms this morning. And if you're scheduled to be baptized, you can start making your way over. If you're not scheduled to be baptized and you didn't know you were getting baptized this morning, God did. So if you're here and you say to yourself, I believe in Jesus. I know him as my Lord and Savior and I want to make that known. I want to express outwardly my inward decision. If you want to be baptized this morning, we have shirts for you and airport buckets that you can put your wallet and your phone and your keys in. If you want to do that, would you make your way to the side and talk to somebody really quick? Don't let this moment pass without taking advantage for you to respond. We're going to have musical worship and there'll be words on the screen 
we'll respond in singing together. There'll be prayer on the sides and down front where you can go and have continued prayer. You're all sitting in a seat. Turn around right behind your back, that piece of paper that's been like an annoying tag. Turn around, grab it really quick. It says joy on it. That's our invitation to Christmas, to our Christmas Eve service. Maybe your response right now is to take time and consider who does God put in my life that he wants me to invite, that needs to know this joy, that needs to know this Jesus. As you walked in, you got a, a volunteer form for Christmas Eve. You can fill that out. Maybe that's your response to Jesus in this season. In about 30 seconds, this, move, this room is going to start to move. People are going to go to prayer. People are going to walk to baptism and maybe decide today, right now, in this moment, that they want to be baptized. We're going to witness people be baptized, and we're going to cheer and celebrate with them. We're going to respond in worship. We're going to think about how we might serve and invite people to, to Christmas. Why? Because we respond to the one that says, Behold, for I am alive forevermore. What will your response be this morning? There's a variety of opportunities. If, if you, like I said already, we're not scheduled to be baptized, but want to, would you make your way to the side? I'd love to talk to you. We'll see you get baptized. All of us will sing and worship together. We'll give of our offering. We'll celebrate as people are baptized, and we'll get to respond to our Heavenly Father and to His Son, Jesus Christ. Your grace. 
Every part of my world Take this life and breathe on This heart that is now yours You can have it all, Lord Every part of Take this life and breathe on this heart that is now yours. Above, I lay it all down. I 
Praise the Lord. I'm going to stay about a foot away from this microphone so that we don't see the power of the Holy Spirit. But what a gift, as Jesus is the generous gift that keeps giving to us over and over and over again. Hey. Zach and I are going to stay in the water just a little bit longer. And the Spirit of the Lord is beckoning you in believer's baptism. Don't let anything stop you from coming to the water and choosing to be obedient to believer's baptism. We got a towel for you. We got a shirt for you. You don't got to worry about what you go home like. This is about you and Jesus. Because let me tell you something. He is the generous gift that keeps giving. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Hey guys, my name is Caitlin. And I'm Jeremy. And we want to say welcome to Coast Hills and Happy Together Weekend. There's lots of excitement around here as we get ready for Christmas. Christmas celebrations start at Coast Hills at 4 p.m. We are having the best Christmas party ever called All is Bright. It's everything you love about Christmas in one afternoon. It's really fun and we hope you'll invite all your friends to come with you. We are also looking forward to celebrating Christmas Eve with you. This year we are going to have five Christmas Eve services. We have special invitations available that you can personalize and hand out to people. And we also need your help with these services. So please fill out the volunteer sign-up form you received on your way in and drop it off at the Connect Space in the lobby and someone will follow up with you. Also, Christmas Day, December 25th, falls on a Sunday this year. And everyone will be home for Christmas because we won't be having Sunday services at Coast Hills. Instead, you can join us on Facebook Live for a quick devotion with Pastor Chet. More details on that to come. That's all we have for you today. We hope you have a great Sunday and a great week.